If you take your copy of Scripture and turn to the book of John, John chapter 15. And uh, we're going to continue on in our series about discipleship this week. And, and, you know, we've kind of been taking some philosophical approach to this, uh, the whys and before we get to the hows. And this is kind of another why one today. But, but it really kind of answers an important question. And, and here's the thing I think. I don't know how your um, discipleship relationship with Jesus is, uh, but mine has been full of stops and starts. Um, it seems like I'll take two steps forward and five steps backwards. Anybody else ever feel that way? And, and really, you know, we have to answer the question, you know, how do we bounce back from that? How do we keep going? You know, how do we continue to follow Jesus? Now, last week we talked about being and not doing. And, and here's the problem. As we struggle, we really focus hard on the doing, don't we? I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do better. I'm going to be more. But I want to talk to you about something today like that, that I think is the fundamental fear of all of us who follow Jesus. Or at least it's mine. Maybe it's not yours. What happens if you let Jesus down? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you let him down? Have you ever felt like you betrayed him? That, that you've done something in your life that's just a betrayal of who Jesus is to you and who he is in your life. How do you bounce back from that? How do you continue on? Well, today we're going to talk about abiding in Christ and what that really means. Now, before we jump into that, I want to give you some context of what's going on uh, in John, the couple of chapters before we get here, because if we don't do that, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. In John chapter 13, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, and he tells the disciples that one of them is going to betray him that night. In fact, two actually do. And as he tells them that, they all kind of get a little scared, right? They all start asking each other, going, hey, well, do you think it's me? Maybe it's you. I don't know. Is it me? I don't know. It could, be, it could be you. I don't know. And then Judas leaves. And they don't still have no clue that Judas is going to be the one who's going to betray Jesus. They're still kind of worried about themselves. And then Jesus does this amazing thing. He gets up from the table. He sets aside his uh, clothes. He puts on a cloth and he gets down and he washes the disciples' feet. And then he begins to give these guys some hope and comfort in the midst of their struggle. They're worried that they're going to betray Jesus. They're worried that they're going to let him down. They're worried that they're not going to make it. And then we get this wonderful passage in John chapter 14 where Jesus does two different things. At the very beginning of John 14, he tells them, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house that where I am, you may be also. And then he says later in the chapter that as I'm going away, I'm not going to leave you alone. In fact, I'm going to send somebody to you. And his name is the Helper, the Holy Spirit. And he's going to come and he's going to bring you my peace. And then we get this wonderful passage here in John chapter 15 to give us the hope and the help that we need to understand, much like the disciples did, how do we bounce back? How do we bounce back when we betray him? How do we bounce back when we fail? How do we keep on keeping on? I want you to read with me today in John 15. And I, want to, I want you to hear the hope and comfort and help that comes from the lips of Jesus. Jesus says in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Awesome words. And so Jesus starts out to help us understand as following him, there are going to be times when we struggle. 
There are going to be times when we feel, feel, feel fearful and doubtful and, and worried and afraid, just like these disciples were. I mean, they were really struggling with the fact that, that somebody tonight was going to betray him and they were worried it was going to be him. And then he speaks these words. He says, I am the true vine. One of the things that we're going to struggle with all throughout our Christian faith, and I want you to hear me say this, that struggling and doubt are not wrong. It's part of growth. You can't truly fully grow in Christ until you have to struggle through your faith and maybe struggle through some doubt and worry and fear. And one of the fears always is, Jesus, are you really the one? I mean, I've, I've given you everything and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, going all in with you here. Are you really the one? And here's what Jesus says, I am the true vine. Jesus gives us the reassurance that we've not chosen wrong. Isn't that a good reassurance to have? If you're going to place your eternity on someone, your hope for eternity on someone, if you're going to place your hope of forgiveness of sins, you better make sure you've chosen correctly, Right? And Jesus says, I am the true vine. You have not chosen wrong. I'm the one. Now, the, the two words that really make that the most powerful, he says, I am. And I'll have to remind you, when God revealed himself to Moses, what did he use? I am. And so Jesus is helping them. He's reminding them that he is the I am. And here's what he's saying. I am all that you need. I am all that you need. And he's very powerfully shown them this through the Lord's Supper. He's just changed the Passover meal. They were celebrating Passover and they were getting ready. They had sacrificed the lamb and they'd put it over the doorposts of the house. And they had done all the, the religious rituals of the Passover. And Jesus takes all that and he transforms it and says, I am. I am. And, and, and John is full of the I am statements of Jesus. Let me just share some with you that Jesus shares here. He says, I am the Lamb of God who takes away sin in John chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist saw Jesus and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isn't it amazing that here they're having a Passover meal and they've just sacrificed a lamb and Jesus is saying, I am the Lamb. This Lamb that takes away sin, Jesus, Jesus says, I am the Lamb that takes away the sin of the entire world, not just individuals. I am all that you need. Jesus says, I am the living water. He tells that to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And not only is he living water that gives life, he says that I'm the kind of water that once you drink of it, you never have to drink of it again. A well kind of gets put down inside of you, and this living water just keeps springing up inside of you, a never-ending supply. Jesus says, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. How powerful that statement now becomes is he's just celebrated the Lord's Supper with him and he broke the bread and said, this is my body. It's a reminder for them and a reassurance for us that we've not chosen wrong if we put our hope and faith and trust in Christ because he is all that we need. Jesus says, I am. I am all that you need. I am the true vine. Again, how powerful. He says, I am the true vine. I am the source of life. And, and remember, he took the cup after he took the bread and he said, this is my blood, which is given for you. It's the fruit of the vine that they were drinking. And Jesus says, I am the true vine. And then Jesus says in John chapter 11, right before this wonderful night that they had together, right before he goes into the garden, is betrayed by Judas, right before he goes on trial, he's betrayed by Peter. Right before he goes to the cross, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus standing at a tomb of a dear friend who had recently died. And people were mourning and crying. And his sisters were saying, if you'd only been here, you could have done something about it. And Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And then he shows them by raising Lazarus from the dead. Listen, I can't think of anything better or more powerful when you're struggling with fear and doubt than the reassurance that Jesus is who he says he is and he did what he said he did. I am the true vine. You have chosen correctly. 
And then he says, I am all that you're looking for. I'm all that you're looking for. Because here's the thing, ultimately all of us are looking for the same thing. Just like the disciples, we want to be connected to something and we want to be clean. We want to be connected and we want to be clean. We want to be connected to something that gives us purpose and hope and forgiveness. And we want to be clean because we all know our hearts. We all know our lives. We all know our story. And we need someone to come in and clean up the story of our life. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm all that. I'm all that you're looking for. I'm, I'm the person that you need to be connected with. And I'm the person that can make you clean. Look at what he says here in verse 15. He says, I am the true vine, verse 1, and my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes it so that it may bear, bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Listen, Jesus is saying by being the vine that we have to be connected to him to be connected to God. There's no other way to be connected to God but other than Jesus Christ. There's no religious system. There's no rituals that you can do. There's no education that you can get. Here's what Jesus is saying. It's not all these things. It's relationship. It's connection. If you want life, if you want God, if you want to be clean, you have to be connected to me. It doesn't come anywhere else. And then he says, if you are in me, You've been cleaned already. Now, I really, for a long time, didn't understand why verse 3 was there. It just seemed weird because he's talking about being in the vine and being a branch and doing this and doing that. And then he says, you're already clean. Like, what? You're talking about branches and now you're talking about cleaning? Those are two different things. No, they're not. Connection with Jesus, connection to God brings cleanliness in our life. And let me tell you what that means. When you are connected to Jesus, his blood and his forgiveness is transferred to you and he makes you clean. He makes you clean. It's not what you do. It's not what church you go to. It's not what rituals you perform. It's being connected to him. And I love what he says here. You are already clean because you're in me. Now here's the tricky part for us as believers. We struggle so much because we see the sin that we still struggle with. We see all these kind of things. And so here's the worry what we have. Maybe forgiveness didn't take. Now I'm going to let you in a little craziness that I think sometimes. When I, I'm really struggling with sin, I kind of think, okay, God, I believe in you. And I, I think that you've saved me, but, but maybe it didn't take. You know, maybe it's not working the way it's supposed to work because I'm struggling. And Jesus comes in and says, listen, you're already clean because you're in me. You're already clean because you're in me. I am all that you need. I am all that you're looking for. And here's what Jesus wants from us. He desires for us to desire to be connected to him and be cleaned by him. I want, you to, I want you to put yourself in the disciples' position. They're sitting around the table with Jesus. He's done this amazing thing by kind of rearranging the Lord's Supper. And then he washes their feet and does all these kind of things. And they're really struggling. And he's been communicating hope to them. What would it do to your fears if Jesus looked at you and said, hey, you're already clean. You're already clean because you're in me. You have hope because you're in me. You have power because you're in me. You have connection to God because you're in me. You give us the hope to be able to, to live through that fear. But what's the secret? What's the secret of discipleship? And that's what everybody's really wanting to know. What are the things that I need to do? What are the things I need to believe? How, what is this stuff that I need to know to be connected to Jesus? And he's gonna tell us in verse four. Abide in me and I will abide in you. This is the secret to discipleship. If you don't get this, you can't progress any further because this is where the power comes from. This is where the, the being comes from. This is where the belonging comes from, abiding in Christ. And here's the, the, the wonderful power of this, wonderful secret of this. When we abide in him and he abides in us, it gives us the confidence, the hope, and the security to hang in there when we don't always live up to the things that Jesus wants us to do. 
Here's one of the things that I love about this passage. Jesus speaks this to Peter right before Peter is going to go out and deny him three times. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how I would feel having heard these things and then I go right out and, and betray Jesus, deny him, in fact, curse and saying, I don't know the man. I don't know if I could pick myself back up and, and try to start again and, and be a part again. And yet Peter kind of does that. And in fact, Jesus comes back after his resurrection and welcomes him back in. But this is it. This is the secret. This is the confidence. This is the power to hang in there. Now, I, I, I looked this up and it's pretty amazing. I, I saw this in one of the commentaries and I, I checked it out because it's true. This word abide or remain, whatever your translation, or rest, whatever your translation may say. This word abide appears 11 times in these 11 verses that we read this morning. Jesus is trying to tell us something. You know, when you repeat something over and over again, you're trying to get somebody's attention. Moms, dads, right? You follow me on that one? How many times do we have to repeat the same thing over and over again to get our kids to do it? I told you to pick that up. I said, pick that up. No, pick this up. Put your hand down and pick it up. Jesus says 11 times in these 11 verses, abide, abide. It's used 40 times in the gospel of John. It's used 27 times in the three epistles of John. What is he trying to teach us? What does that word abide really mean? Well, he tells us. He says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What Jesus is saying here, and this is a, a wonderful thing. Jesus is saying, listen, abiding means this. I want to make my home in you and I want you to make your home in me. This is an old word, but you ever heard the word abode? It's another word for a house where you live. And Jesus is saying, listen, I want to live in you and I want you to live in me. And, and this is the amazing thing that's happening here. Jesus is basically saying, look, I want to come and take up residence in your heart and your life. And he's ready to move some stuff in. I don't know if you've ever had that experience of uh, getting a new roommate. When, when I was in college, we, would, uh, we had four roommates in the dorm that I lived in. And so we were always kind of rotating people in and out. And move-in day was pretty scary, right? Because you never knew who you were getting and you never knew what they were bringing. And, and one move-in day, we had this guy, and I could already tell he was a little bit cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs when he, when he moved in. Um, and he just starts moving in all of his stuff. And, and not just in his room, it just like everywhere. Oh, your stuff's there? No, I'm moving it and putting my stuff there. And, and it was really difficult because I'm kind of going, who gave you the right to do that? You don't own this place. But here's the thing. Jesus does the same thing when he moves into our life. He begins to move stuff into our house and begins to move stuff out of its place because he has the right to do that. This is where we struggle because Jesus starts moving stuff and changing priorities and saying, I want to put my stuff here and I want to move your stuff out. And you kind of go, or, or maybe I do, maybe you don't. I do say, well, who gave you the right to do that? <laughs> I'm God and I died for you, right? But he wants to move his stuff in and, and he tells us in here what he wants to move in. He wants to move in his word. He wants to move in his commandments. He wants to move in his love and his peace and his joy. And he wants to move out all the stuff that separates us from him. Jesus is saying the secret to being my disciple is letting me make my home inside of you and letting you make your home inside of me. I want to live in you and I want you to live in me. And here's the thing that we need to understand, and this is very important. Jesus rearranges our heart and Jesus rearranges our mind and Jesus rearranges our lives to make it more comfortable for him. And we should want that, right? We should want our heart, we should want our minds, we should want our lives and our actions to be comfortable for Jesus. But Jesus says, look, I'm coming. If you're gonna abide in me and I'm gonna abide in you, you wanna be connected, you wanna be clean, well, I'm coming and I'm, I'm gonna make an extreme home makeover. And I'm gonna make it comfortable for me. And I know sometimes that's scary for us. I know sometimes that's like, well, I have no control over that, but can I just tell you something? Let me just guarantee you this. 
when Jesus moves in and Jesus makes over a place that's comfortable to him, it is beneficial to us. It's beneficial to us. Because our house, our home, our heart, our lives becomes the things that we've always wanted them to be. He wants to make his home in us and for us to make our home in him. Now, how we make our home in him, Jesus kind of gives us this understanding. Making him our home means that apart from him, we can do nothing. And in verse four, he says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, you hear him say that, apart from me, you can do nothing. And yet we do lots of things apart from him, don't we? Let's be honest. We do lots of things apart from Jesus. So what is he saying? If he says, apart from me, you can do nothing, what is he saying? He's saying that, but what we do, the things that we do without him, we can do lots of things without spiritual power and eternal value. We can do nothing of spiritual, with spiritual power and nothing of eternal value without him. And so here's what happens. We, we get to this place where we're trying to accomplish things in our own power, in our own will, in our own way. And we wonder why it fails and we wonder why it's a struggle. And we wonder why things just blow up in our face. And Jesus says, because you're doing stuff apart from me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing with spiritual power, nothing with eternal value. So when, he, when we make our home in him and abiding in him basically means this. Stop trying to accomplish things in your own power and your own strength. Psalm 46.10, I think, gives us the best example of what that means. The way we like to say it is, be still and know that I am God. The literal translation is, stop striving and know that I'm God. Stop striving. See, we, we, we have this idea that we have to do more and we have to be more. And it's just this thing always, we're just grinding it out for Jesus. We're just trying for Jesus. Jesus says, stop striving and rest. Stop striving and surrender. Stop striving and live in me and let me live in you. And then you'll bear much fruit. See, we focus on the negative. We never look at the positive. Listen to what he says again. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him does what? Bears much fruit. Th this is it. When we let Jesus make his home in us and we make our home in Jesus, the connection is we're going to bear much fruit. Why? Because we suddenly got smart or we suddenly got holy, we suddenly got better than everybody else? No, because now we have access to him and to his power and his life and what he can do for us. You will bear much fruit. And then he says in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Jesus makes the promise that when we are connected to him, when we live in him and he lives in us, if we abide in him, you will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. There will be signs of his life in you. Just like the disciples as they're struggling to figure out, am I the one or am I really connected to Jesus? Am I really gonna make this thing work? Am I really gonna be his disciple? They're looking for signs of life. 
There are a lot of times in our lives that we're looking around and going, Jesus, I don't, I don't feel you much anymore. I don't really experience you much anymore. And so we're looking for signs of life. And here's what he says. If you're connected to me, you will bear fruit. There will be signs of me in your life. And I know this shouldn't be said, but I need to say this. You cannot be connected to Jesus and not bear fruit. There is no such thing as a fruitless branch on the vine of Jesus Christ. If you are fruitless, it means you are not connected to Christ. And he tells us what he does with those branches. If you're not in me, I throw you away. If you're not producing, if there's no fruit, you are not connected to me. And here's the thing we need to understand. If we are connected to Jesus, there has to be fruit in our life. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to show up in our life and do nothing. It's not how he works. You cannot be connected to Jesus and not have fruit in your life. Now, here's an amazing thing that Jesus says, and I don't want, to, to, I want us to get this twisted. But one of the things that happens, one of the fruit that we begin to have is you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done. Verse 7, let's read it. I want you, want you to look at it with your eyes so you can see this. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, we have uh, friends in the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. They love this verse. They jerk it out of context. And here's what they say. Ask anything of God and he will give it to you. You need a million dollars? Ask for it. He'll give it to you. You need a better looking spouse? Ask for it. He'll give it to you. You need what better behaved kids? Ask for it. He'll give it to you. This is not what Jesus is saying. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, and when we are connected to him and we abide in him, one of the fruits or one of the signs of life that we see is as we are asking things in Jesus' name, and that's called prayer, if you've never heard that before, it's called prayer. As we pray, our prayers get answered. And here's the, the powerful thing. He's not saying this is a blank check to ask whatever you wish. Here's what he's saying. When you ask with me in mind, with me in heart, Kind of the prayer that Jesus had in the garden. Father, this is what I want, but not my will, but your will be done. And God's will was done. There's this amazing sign, this amazing fruit that begins to happen in our life when we pray. And here's the thing, prayers get answered. Now, I don't want to lead you astray. I don't want you to, to think false things. When God says no, did your prayer get answered? This is Yes. See, that doesn't factor into the health, wealth, and prosperity understanding of this. If God says no, you didn't ask right. If God says no, you didn't have enough faith. If God says no, there's some sin in your life. But no, here's what Jesus says. When we pray, when we ask in his name, God will answer. And sometimes the best answer that God gives us is no. I noticed we didn't get any amens on that. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. We'll, we'll work on this together. It's okay. Sometimes the best answer that God gives us is not now. And then sometimes when God says yes, he says yes in a way that we can't even possibly think or imagine. I've seen that in my life. 18 months before I showed up in New Mexico, I began praying, God, do something in my life. God, use me. God, I want to be used by you and I want to do whatever you want me to do. And he said, yes, and I never thought the yes would be moved to New Mexico. <laughs> but I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad. God told me not now for 18 months because he was prepping something for me that I couldn't even imagine or expect. And dear ones, what you need to hear is this. Jesus says that one of the signs that he's working in your life is prayers get answered. It's yes, not now. And no, and all of those are good. Ask whatever you wish, and it'll be done for you. One of the signs that we need to see in our life that we'll bear much fruit or that his life is in us is in verse 11. He says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. One of the signs that God's life is in us, that Christ is in us and we are abiding in him, one of the byproducts of that is joy. You know, I said you can't be connected to Jesus and not have fruit. You can't be connected to Jesus and not have joy. 
Let me tell you what makes me doubt people's faith and my faith more than anything. When they walk around like somebody has punched them in the mouth. They've been sucking on lemons and they just have this sour disposition and this sour attitude all the time. And I'm like, Jesus equals joy. Now that doesn't mean all the time in every circumstances, but it means the overarching thing of our life is joy. Because look at what Jesus says, that your joy, may, my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. If we're not joyful, there's a problem. We may not be connected to him the way that we need to be. One of the things that Jesus is talking about here, I believe, and I think farmers, you guys will get this, when there's a big harvest that comes at the end of the year, what do you feel? Joy. All this hard work and all this time and all this blood, sweat, and tears that I've put in, I see it. Look at this, man, this is a harvest and I get to enjoy it and I get to share it and this is amazing. Same thing with when Jesus lives in us. The harvest that he brings in our life is joy and it is full and it's ready to be reaped any time. My joy will be in you and your joy will be full, full to overflowing. And then real quick, I want to close with this. There's something in here that, that I hold on to, and it's verse 8. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. This is a promise. God will be glorified in your life if you are connected to Jesus. God will not let you fail. God will not let you fall away. God will not let you blow your life up. But he'll be glorified in you. He'll be glorified in your life and by your life. This, this has been one that's really hard for me to wrap my head around, and I'm thankful it's in Scripture because it's easy for me to go, no, nah, that, that doesn't mean me. God is glorified in my life by the things that he does in and for me, but God is also glorified by my life through the things that he does in, in, in me and through me. He does both. People can look at my life and say, man, God's really doing some stuff in your life. And I say, amen. But then also God's glorified because of the things that he allows me to do for other people. God's glorified. And it's not just me. It's anybody who's connected to Jesus. God will be glorified in your life. Now, let me tell you how he receives glory. One of the ways he receives glory is by pruning out the diseased and dead parts of our life. Now, I don't really understand all this. I don't take care of plants. I, I don't have a green thumb. I have a black thumb. If you give me anything live other than children, I will kill it. <laughs> it's just the way that it is. But, but here's one of the things that God does. He, he takes pride in the fact that he knows how to come into our life and prune out things that are bringing in disease and hurt and pain. And he prunes them out so that we grow. And then he steps off to the side and says, look at my handiwork. And, and here's one of the things, I say this in counseling all the time. When God is pruning in your life, when he's bringing up these things that are difficult and they're hard and they're hurtful, he's not doing it to condemn you, he's doing it to heal you. And one of the things that I have found is God never overwhelms us with the pruning that he's doing. Again, I, I, don't, I understand, I read this in a book and I don't understand it completely, but you can over prune a plant, right? You cut off too much stuff and what happens? It dies. And God knows how to prune and he knows when to prune and he knows the ways to prune. And so here's the thing we need to understand. If there's something that's going on in our life that's bubbled up to the surface, God wants to prune it because he wants you to be healthy and he wants to heal you. And he receives glory by that. He receives glory by proving you to be one of his disciples. I've always misread this and, and thought it's my job to prove myself as his disciple. Mm -mm. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus is saying it is my father's glory to bring fruit in your life because when you're connected to me, fruit happens. And the vine dresser, the father, is the one pruning and making sure that fruit continues to happen and you bear more fruit. And so here's the thing. God's the one at work making fruit happen in your life so he can step back and go, there it goes. And when we reap, when we, when we produce and we show fruit and people look at us, 
They're going to look at our fruit and not see us. They're going to see our Father. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God receives glory in us by producing fruit for us. And people see that fruit and go, wow, yeah, that's God's work in your life. And then my favorite is we receive glory by ministering to others. God receives glory in us by ministering to others through us. We are the hose of God's blessing. We are the hose of God's mercy. We are the hose of God's forgiveness and grace and peace to other people. One of the greatest proofs of God's existence is his people letting him work through them to other people. At the darkest times of my life, when I didn't believe God was there, God continued to show up just with human skin on. And I could not walk away and I could not deny because I kept seeing, feeling, and experiencing God through his people. So, are you connected to Jesus? Have you ever asked him to move in your life? I love that analogy. He wants to move in. Have you ever asked him to do that? Have you ever just come to the place and said, I am a sinner and I need you to move in my life so I can be connected with you and clean? If you haven't, today's the day. Today's moving day. It's time for Jesus to move in and let him move out all that death and all that shame and all that guilt. And let him move in his love and forgiveness and joy and peace and change you forevermore. Are you connected to him? What power is at work in your life? If you're here and you are broken, if you are here and you are tired, if you are here and you are miserable and bitter, let me, let me just speculate for a second and say, you've been doing it in your own power, in your own way. If you want to be refreshed and renewed and restored and to be joyful, it's time to get on your face before God and let him put his power to work in your life. Because apart from him, you can do nothing. You can have victory today if you surrender. And I want to say this and then we're going to pray. What are you praying and asking God to do for you today? If you're connected to him and we can ask and he will answer, what are you asking? What are you asking him to do? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time. What I'm asking you for today is to speak to me and my brothers and sisters. Help us to see where we are before you. And if we're not connected to you, God, if we're just struggling under our own power and our own will and our own way, God, that you would give us the grace and faith to get up out of our seat, come fall on our face before you and cry out to you, surrender to you, abide in you, and be made new. My prayer is that you would make this a place of grace where people meet you and your love, and are transformed. My prayer is that we would see people today move from death to life, from shame to peace, from brokenness to healing. And we would give you all the praise and honor and glory. So Father, we just turn this time over to you now and pray that you would speak to our heart and help us respond in faith to you. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.